Hey, I'm Mac. Welcome back to my channel. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and consider joining my Patreon for access to new videos 12 to 24 hours early, as well as some Patreon exclusive content. So ever since I found that interview with Dave Hollis on the Impact Theory um, YouTube channel by Tom Bill Yo, I think, I think that's how he says his name, Bill Yo, Bill Yo. See, I, I know I could look it up and learn how to pronounce it, um, but I'm deliberately choosing not to because I don't respect him. <laughs> He's basically got a self-help guru, hot garbage channel. And it honestly is mesmerizing to me because all of his content is like one to three hours long. And... It gets a surprisingly high number of views. And that troubles me because he puts out three videos a week. And I realize that my videos are long as well. Okay, I get it. But it's just it it's a lot to be taking in because this is when you're when you're in a self-help context, you're kind of it's not really educational but it is didactic so you're kind of going in look to receive information and to be taught you know so you're 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 a little bit more of a sponge with self-help content and that troubles me to think of these people who watch this channel uh like taking in one to three hours of content three times a week from this guy that's a lot to be taking in. And I just, I, I, it just, it's just troubling to me. And it seems like a lot of wasted time, but maybe I'm wrong. So I thought we would take a look at uh, Tom Bilyeu's little, um, he just posted this video. It's his most recent video. And it is called the ultimate advice for every young person. And you know, I mean, I consider myself to be, you know, young in terms of like adult phases of life, you know, because like I'm not middle aged yet, but so I guess I'm young for like in, in terms of adult phases, but I'm going to assume that we're talking about like young, young person as in like school aged, like you haven't started your career yet, you're still in your formative years. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I get asked to give advice to to that set. So I guess I would just like to know uh, what others are telling them. So let's find out. By the way, if you don't know who this guy is, apparently we've decided collectively that selling some terrible tasting garbage nutrition energy bars is truly how we how we determine who is just the best smartest person so if someone makes an energy bar you got to listen this guy is one of the three founders of quest nutrition i don't know if you've seen those like i guess they're like protein and energy bars I don't know, I always see them at like gas stations or whatever. Um, I mean, I would not eat one, but because I don't eat that shit. But <laughs> yeah, he sucks is what I'm saying. I'm very excited. In fairness, I have been to Mars, so there's that. Uh, you weren't supposed to mention it, though. So but thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I want to know, how many born entrepreneurs do we have in the crowd? Don't be shy about it. How many born entrepreneurs do we have? Let's hear you. All right, there we go. So here's the bad news. I am not a born entrepreneur, and that is very important for you to know about me. I had a, what I'll call a slave's mentality. I kept my head down, I did as little work as possible, and I avoided punishment at all costs. That's where my life began. It's, thank you for laughing at my pain. Well, I just think it's great that slavery is is right right where this, you know, privileged little white boy goes, you know, because obviously <laughs> the problem with slavery is their mentality. You know, if they would just 
if they would just, you know, have more positive mindset instead of having a slave's mentality, maybe it wouldn't have been so bad. God, I can't even finish that. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Like, just don't. You know, when you th feel yourself about to compare anything in your life to slavery, just, just stop and think of something else. Think of something like, you know, my, something mildly inconvenient for everybody else, you know, that seems like the worst thing to you. Because listen, listen, you're you're like a multi-millionaire. He might even be like a hundred, hundred millionaire, probably. I think he, I think he has a he has a very high net worth, which is surprising. I can't believe Nutrition Bars got him there, but whatever. It's it just further proof that you know, becoming extremely wealthy like that is not a function of having a good idea or a function of, you know, being better at something or being smarter. It's just a function of being more uh, morally gray and more just unethical, generally being more ruthless. That That's the difference, okay? And being privileged. <laughs> It really was um, brutal. Growing up for me, I felt entirely like- mm, Was it brutal for you? Was it brutal just like slavery? Like, what the fuck? Lost, I felt entirely out of control. I had visions of what I wanted my life to become, but I had absolutely no idea how I was ever going to get there. And understanding that and really believe- Wow, that sounds really, really hard. You had visions of what you wanted your life to be, but like, how are you gonna get it there? Wow, like is there anything harder in life than that? It's a good thing that he's giving people advice because like you really want your advice to come from someone who has been through legitimately hard things. And I mean, it really sounds like he's been through like extreme, like have you ever had things that you wanted and you didn't know how you were gonna get them? That's right, you haven't, have you? See, he knows how to struggle. Being that, that that's where I started, the rest of my journey becomes that much more interesting to you because I have some fundamental beliefs. Kind of playing it fast and loose with the word interesting. I believe that we're all trapped in the matrix. And the matrix- Well, that was a swerve. Are the limiting beliefs that you've pulled over your own eyes. They're all a bunch of lies. And so it's really learning how to get yourself out of that, to get rid of the limiting beliefs so that you can execute against your dreams. But it starts with belief, and humans lead with belief. Growing up, I knew two things about myself. I grew up in a morbidly obese household that teetered between blue collar and white collar. And I knew in my future, two things would be true. One day- I Listen, everybody thinks that about themselves. Like everybody says they're middle class, okay? Because I, I don't know, for some reason, everybody tries like people will go like way out of their way to define themselves as being m like middle class, especially people who are like in the lower upper class. Like the, they're, they're like, yeah, like, no, we're like totally, but it's like, okay, stop. Like middle class is just a construct that's total bullshit invented by the like bourgeoisie to prevent the the working class from uniting okay like come on let's be real here and and the fact that he even will admit to being teetering between uh, like blue collar and white collar that tells you that it's white collar because americans will always downplay how wealthy their family was so so like double that i would have six pack abs and one day i'd be rich I had absolutely no idea how I was going to make those come true, but I knew that they were going to be two of the things that I was going to make come true in my life. Now, it's important to understand that Quest Nutrition is a company that rose from the ashes of misery. Each and every one of you, at some point in your life, you are going to hit rock bottom. The question isn't, will you hit rock bottom? The question is, what are you going to do with yourself when it happens? And for me, I was teaching film and I met these two buff rich guys and I thought, oh my God, six. Oh yeah. That was my plan too in college. Pack abs and wealth. <laughs> I've got to follow these guys. It's literally like I was meant to meet them. And they said, Tom, you're coming to the world with your hand out. And if you want to control your art, if you want to control your life, you've got to get rich. So, hey, come on. 
We're start- Oh, okay. Like, I, I need to write that down. Get rich. Oh, okay. Starting this technology company, we need a copywriter. You'd be perfect for the job. So I went and I- Does he just think that that happens for everybody where these two very, wow, I did him a lot of favors with that pause right there. Look at, he, yeah, he looks like a friggin' model there. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, that just happens for everybody. And I, I love how he, like, clearly these people already knew him, right? So that's privilege right there. That's connections. That's clearly connections that he had through, like, family or previous jobs or through school. Probably went to an expensive-ass school since he was studying film. So, I mean, <laughs> clearly has a lot of opportunities that are not afforded to other people. And furthermore... Uh, he, <laughs> I, I love how it's just like, oh yeah. And then this incredible job opportunity just fell out of the sky for me. So I am sure if you guys would have just said yes to the two burly guys who came in and offered you a job, you would be in the same place as I am. But you guys didn't do that, did you now? And it's like, well, the two guys didn't come in, okay? Ugh. I've said this before on this channel, six pack abs are not a function of doing crunches. It's just a function of body fat percentage. That's all it is. I did it and they said, but don't think of yourself as a copywriter. And it's very, very difficult to maintain them long-term. Like, 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 like I don't have a six pack. Like, and I, I feel like, I feel like I'm pretty skinny. I have pretty low body fat, but like, it's almost impossible to maintain like really visible six pack abs. Like, just day to day, <laughs> like you, mm, it's not healthy. Understand, this is a startup. You can have any job in this company that you want. You just have to become the right person for the job. So I took them seriously, and I started working my ass off to get better, to focus on the things that I needed to do in order to get good, to grow, and be able to execute. And well, that all sounds great, dude. I'm sure a lot of your audience would do that too if they had that opportunity, but they don't. So what's your recommendation? If you can't get us from the point where we are now to the point where we have that job, then this is utterly useless because that's the fucking easy part. The easy part is working hard when you, while you're at that opportunity. That's the easy part. He's saying it like it's the hard part. That's not the hard part. The hard part is getting that opportunity. I got so good that by the time we sold that company, I was the chief marketing officer and they'd given me 10% of the company just based on performance. So imagine giving somebody something that amounts to millions of dollars just based on how hard they've worked. That was the kind of blood, sweat, and tears that I put into it. But when I came into it, we all thought it was gonna take us about 18 months to sell the company. Eight and a half years later, in the depths of despair, Oh, go fuck yourself. Oh, was your, oh, was your cushy eight year startup program, was that so hard for you? Mm, it sounds like it was pretty well funded since it lasted for eight years. Okay. It sounds like you didn't have to, um, you know, file for bankruptcy or anything. Like it, the fact that you were going on for eight years, sounds like you had either some pretty good, some pretty good luck there, or you had some really good funding. Either way, that doesn't sound that hard, sir. I'm sorry. It sounds like you just haven't had anything actually difficult happen in your life. So I'm wondering why the fuck you're here up on this stage. Oh, I guess that's because you've made a lot of money, but our system is so fucked up that we allocate that amount of money to someone who fucking makes nutrition bars. What the fuck? I realized something had to change. And I went to my partners and I quit. And I said, guys, here's your equity back. I don't believe I should get anything. I don't plan to cross the finish line. I'm gonna go do something that makes me feel alive. And let me tell you right now, I said that from the position of being in a place where I had ownership in a company worth millions of dollars. I was making more money than I'd ever made in my life. I was standing in a beautiful conference room overlooking the Pacific Ocean in the house of a company that we had built that was winning awards. And I was so fundamentally unhappy that I finally had the first 
of what will become a string of very profound and important realizations. And that is the game you think you're playing is money. But I promise the game you're actually playing is brain chemistry. If I gave you four billion dollars tomorrow, but inside you felt suicidal and you felt worthless, what would be the point of the money? Uh, to, to buy things like food and um, shelter with that currency. Also, I could get access to mental health care so that hopefully I would not continue being suicidal because in this country, money is a big factor in whether people can have access to mental health care. So with that $4 billion, I'm sure I could get a great team to work on my mental health and soon I would not feel suicidal. Okay, so th there's that. Conversely, if I gave you $3, but you felt fulfilled and like you were contributing not only to yourself, to your family, to other people. You felt alive inside and what you're doing meant something to you and you felt that you had significance. What does the money matter? Uh, it matters on the first of the month when the rent is due um, and $3 isn't enough to pay for it. That, that's when it matters. So, I mean, these rich people just say the dumbest shit. And, Need I remind you, the title of this presentation, this video as uploaded was it was the ultimate advice for every young person. Okay, most young people will never, ever, 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 ever have anything remotely like the opportunity that was just handed to you throughout your schooling, throughout your, your this, this serendipitous little job opportunity that just fell into your lap and then allowed you to make up enough, um, allowed you to build up enough wealth that you were able to just quit your job because you weren't happy. Okay, see most people, most people will never be able to do that. Most people cannot do that. It, it, but this is the advice for every young person. It's just the dumbest thing. Like, do you, does he actually think that most people can can just do that? They can't. Anybody ever read the poem Richard Cory? I read this poem when I was like nine years old and it left a lasting impression on me. And it was about the best looking, richest guy in town. The guys wanted to be him and the girls wanted to be with him. And the poem ends with Richard Cory going home and putting a bullet in his head. That's the human condition. How many people have you met in your life? You think they're spectacular, they're amazing and yet they're so fundamentally unhappy that they're in the grips of depression. We're okay, depression is like, a, is a health condition. Um, and we're, it's not clear, you know, immediately what the causes are of depression at this point. So what you're talking about is mental health. Um, and once again, mental health care is somewhat of a privilege in this country because you have to be able to afford it. And a lot of people just don't have access like that. So hearing you um, talk about how, oh, it's, it's so, it's so much, you know, just everybody who's rich is just, it's so hard for them. Okay, well, at least they have access to mental health care resources, unlike if you're depressed and you are not wealthy, where you you might, you know, maybe even if you have insurance, maybe you, the copay is still too high. Maybe you're not able to get to a provider um, that has hours that are within your, that are that are compatible with your work schedule. Maybe you can't um, get childcare or whatever while you, when you go to the appointments. Maybe you can't get to a um, provider that is uh, accessible through public transportation and you and you don't have a car. There's all these things, but like if you're if you're wealthy, all of that is no big deal. All you got to do is write the check. So it's a little bit callous to hear him keep talking. <laughs> There's my revenge with the pause finger. It's a little bit callous to hear him keep acting like mental health is like only a problem for rich people when it's not. It, it's, it's, uh, it's a problem for all humans, but it certainly is a problem with much more, um, 
with a much greater breadth of solutions to it when you have a lot of money. Just like most things have a lot more solutions when you have a lot of money. <sighs> I mean, does he think that poor people don't get depressed because they do, it's just they don't really have the choice to just quit their job. They have to keep working or they'll be on the street. They might even be on the street anyway, but they have to keep going because there's 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 only like one other fucking option and that's not really an option. Jesus Christ. That, I mean, it's it's so amazing. You can always tell the level of privilege someone has, like, by how oblivious they are. Not that that's an excuse for being that oblivious, because, like, there's nothing requiring you to be that oblivious. You could just listen to the experiences of other people and stop acting like this. But you're not going to do it, are you? Yeah. Living through a mental pandemic right now, it is almost ubiquitous to know somebody who has depression and or anxiety. And the reason is people don't understand the game they're playing. The game you're playing is a game of brain chemistry. It's chemicals that flow through your brain. It's a mindset. Once you understand that, then you can begin to structure your life in a way that actually makes It is not a mindset. It is a mental health condition. That is as stupid as saying that a broken arm is a mindset. It's not. It, it, is, a, it is a medical problem with medical solutions. Very, very frustrating. Sense. This is a long ass quote, but I'm going to read it all to you because these, once you understand this, you will understand everything you need to know about life. To those humans who are of any concern to me, I wish suffering, desolation, sickness, ill treatment, indignities. I wish that they should not remain unfamiliar with the profound self contempt the torture of self-mistrust, the wretchedness of the vanquished. I have no pity for them because I wish them the one thing that can prove today whether one is worth anything or not. That one endures. You know, just because it's a quote and just because Nietzsche said it doesn't mean that he's right. Like, I, I think that's kind of a terrible sentiment, but okay. It truly is something that only only an obscenely wealthy person who has been very well to do since birth would express honestly like because because people who have known far greater suffering than he will ever know throughout his entire life would never romanticize it like this that's life that's the human condition. Not for you, sweetheart. Most people think that Charles Darwin said that it's the survival of the fittest. Darwin never said that. It was said years after his death. What he did say, and burn this into your nervous system, what Darwin said was, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but rather the most adaptive to change. The reason human beings are the apex adapted to their environment, not adapted to change. Apex predator is because what we are good at is change. What we are good at is taking a stressor, a stimulus, and changing our body. Look at the people around you. Look at homie over there, jacked to the nines. Tommy, shredded. They were not born like this. Okay, I grew up in a morbidly obese family. I'm not supposed to be lean. We adapt because we force ourselves Okay, just, I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna blow right past the whole weird weight thing that he just went through. You know my feelings on that. I, that was just incredibly rude of him to say. Like, number one, that was rude to your family to talk about them like that. Number two, like, just because people in your family are heavier than you are doesn't mean that the same genetic properties got passed on to you like it could be like recessive genes and stuff <laughs> like jesus christ also again you're wealthy it's 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 easier to be skinny when you're wealthy dude um because <laughs> you know healthy food's expensive 
uh, gyms are expensive. The time to work out is expensive or not available to, to people who are of lesser means. Once again, privilege. Um, and furthermore, I don't know what that has to do with evolution. Uh, I, it, he is just extrapolating wildly. Let me tell you something. It is very, very, very dangerous. And it is something people do all the time. It is very, 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 very dangerous to, to extrapolate and draw weird conclusions and advice out of evolution. Because number one, you're probably misunderstanding it. Number two, evolution will operate on its own. It doesn't need your help. And number three, you it, you very, very quickly uh, go into eugenics when you start doing that. Like it, it gets real fucked up real fast when you're like trying to uh, pull social conclusions out of evolution because it like it, furthermore uh, sir evolution happens at a population level not at an individual level so like you are not evolving like like individuals don't evolve it's it's a species a population that over over it happens over generations like it happens over gener like because you can't it nothing that happens within your lifetime is is evolution it's the gradual generation, next generation, next generation, next generation, and how the traits that each one has, each generation has, and how those change, that's evolution. <laughs> and last point, listen, the reason that humans have been a very successful species is that the, our big brains allow us to be a little more clever at problem solving than any other animals. Like, and if you really want to distill it down to one thing, it is that humans are the only species that knows how to start fires. That's, that's the biggest, that's like, that's, that's our killer app is we can start fires. That's like why we can eat so, such a wide variety of things. That's why we can live just about anywhere. Like there's no other animal that starts fires. Okay, so why don't you stop with this? And it's also our ability to cooperate and adapt, okay? But it's not adapting to change. It's the thing that is best adapted to its environment. And it happens to be that if you can start fires, you can adapt to a lot of environments. <laughs> Ugh. People just love to try to get evolution to, to make their point for them. And it's like, no, honey, no. Because you're concerned with things at an individual level. Why? Because you're an individual, okay? You're not concerned with like multiple generations after you. That's evolution. So why don't you just like shut the front door, okay? <sighs> Through something that is painful and we endure. What was Tommy talking about? The takeaway from Angela Duckworth's book that really stuck with him. Many people start, but few endure. It's not interesting whether or not you guys have a dream. I don't care if you have a dream. I am so uninterested in empty dreamers, I can't see straight. What I care about, do you have the fortitude to fail? And what do you learn from that failure? Do you get back up? Do you keep going? Do you force yourself to recognize that this is- Listen, Chumbawamba. You being able, the fortitude to fail, okay? Usually what we're actually talking about here is the priv I keep having to come back to privilege, but I mean, he's a very privileged guy. So uh, it's, it's the privilege to fail. Most people failing means not being able to just keep, you know, going on about your life the way that you were. For a lot of people, that would mean being out on the street. That would mean not being able to find another job. That would mean their kids not getting, you know, clothing and shelter. And that's not something that can happen. Like, that's just completely not something that can be acceptable. So it's not that they don't have the fortitude to fail. It's that they cannot risk it. 
because the consequences would be catastrophic. The question of adaptation. You simply have not done to yourself what you need to do in order to be good enough to succeed. And it really is that simple. Once you accept that the thing that separates you from the rest of the animal kingdom is an unimaginable ability to become. No, it's, it's really the ability to start fires. You have an unimaginable ability to become something. Nope. In 2014, private companies averaged 8% annual growth. After I went into my partners and I said I quit, and I'm gonna go do something that makes me feel alive, they were totally shocked. And I got all the way to my house, and I was on the phone with my wife. I did it. I had been unhappy for so long. And I said I did it. I told them I quit, I gave back the equity, here I am, and I'm pulling into the driveway at my house. And my phone rings, and it's my partner's. And they say, come out to dinner with us. Out of respect and love, I went out to dinner with them, and they said the now famous words, we could do this without you, but we don't want to. And that gave me what I needed to connect to something other than money. Those are famous. It reminded me of the brotherhood. It reminded me that I had fallen in love with these guys as human beings, that there was something more than money. There was something more than being a clever marketer. Are you going to fuck them? That I remembered for a second who I am, the things that make me unique, that I have a desire to connect, that I actually enjoy communities, that I'm not a guy with a killer instinct. I'm not interested in stepping on my, cons my competitor's necks. That's just not how I'm wired. I'm wired to build something. I'm wired to see people shine. I love... You haven't built shit in your life. Seeing other people win, I think it's incredible. Now that doesn't mean that I don't wanna win. I wanna win at the absolute highest level. I wanna be the greatest of all time. I want more people to write about me. Listen, you created a dirt in a wrapper little candy bar. Okay, relax. Okay. You didn't create the smallpox vaccine or anything. So why don't you settle down? Greatest of all time. Listen, you don't become the greatest of all time by never stepping on people, by the way. I'm not saying that it's right. I'm saying that that's how that works. So maybe if you don't want to step on people, then don't have that be your aspiration because that's how you get there. And it, I mean, I, I think that's slimy, but if you, if that's what you want, then also none of this, none of what he's saying will help at all. Any of these people get to the same point that he was at. None of these things will get the, any of them the their version of those two muscular guys coming in and offering you a job that's not going to happen none of this will make that happen and that is what's rare working hard at your job is not rare getting that job that is an opportunity that's rare that that's what people don't know ours because they're terrified to try to match my intros i want that right and I hope each and every one of you wants to play at that level. I hope each and every one of you looks at the greatest of all time and says, if I'm willing to break myself and have to get there, I could do it. But being honest with who you are, being honest that if there's something else that you want to bring to the table, that you find a way to do that. And so I said, guys, I will come back and work with you on one condition. I will never prioritize money again. Oh, for the love of God, you're so fucking full of shit. You're so fucking full of shit. My highest value in business is camaraderie. And at the time, that was sacrilege. We had made a pact with each, there was three of us. The three of us had made an actual pact 
that we would do whatever it took to make our technology company more profitable. And if that meant skipping a family vacation, if that meant waking up at 2 a.m. on a Saturday to meet and brainstorm, we did it. Both of those. Wow, that's two hours before Rachel Hollis. Stories are real. We did things like that. I would go away with my wife for Christmas to see her family in London, and I would literally take a camera with me. Wow, I mean, that's. Guys, did you hear how hard his life is? He's flying to London, you know, but like he's like working remotely while he's there. I mean, that sounds way harder than like trying to make ends meet, you know, at a at a at a shitty minimum wage service job. That like, I mean, <laughs> listen, you don't know hardship until you've flown to London and you had to like do some work on the computer. So I could watch the company back in LA. I've never switched off. I didn't take days off. I was working, no matter where I was, I was working seven days a week. Well, whose fault is that? I didn't take a real vacation, meaning that I wasn't actually working while we were on it for six and a half years. Most people don't get fake vacations. Hello, my friend. You know that I believe success requires Wow, this little promo was, I mean, it was just out of nowhere. There's like, <laughs> that was so sudden. I guess, I guess money doesn't get you transitions. Requires you to see failure as the ultimate learning tool. Success requires you to be disciplined and gritty and to never ever quit on your dreams. I say all of that because one thing is certain, the road to achieving your goal is not smooth or linear. I wish it was, but it's not. It's gonna be bumpy, sometimes scary. Some days you'll take two steps forward and slide 10 steps back. And that's why success also requires you to know how to pull yourself out of a rut and get unstuck fast. Life is short. You can't be messing around with your goals. You've got to- uh, I would say my advice would be don't walk in the middle of the road in Los Angeles like that. Um, if you don't get run over, it's also a good way to get a jaywalking ticket. University called How to Get Unstuck, which you can watch for free with the link on your screen or by clicking below. Four wheel drive. When you join me for that free preview of that workshop from Impact Theory University, I'm going to teach you my strategy for how to understand exactly where you need to be going. Do you see how much time he is asking of his followers. Like now you gotta do the free course, you gotta do the unstuck after you watch like this like million hour thing and then you gotta buy that and this and that. Like you, you cannot tell me that any of the people who are paying for this shit are, are getting anywhere, right? They're not. Because even if what he had to say was at all useful, it's still only useful once you're in that, that opportunity. But it still isn't gonna get you that opportunity. It's never going to. It's just gonna make you feel like you're, you're it's, it's like asymptotic. It's like the, 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 the opportunity or like the, the thing that you really need, like that big break, is, is an asymptote. You're gonna get closer and closer, but you will never get there from, from this shit, ever. He, he, he's just gonna make it seem like, yeah, there's just like this, this one more course that you need. Like, it's just one more, just one more, and then, and then you'll be good. Way to make the most progress towards that goal and keep. Why would, why would he pick these stills to use? That link and let's get to work. All right, I'll see you on the inside. Sir, it's a video, I can't click the link. So if I'm gonna go back to that, this is gonna be in service of something that I can believe in. This is gonna be something that makes me feel alive. This is gonna be something that I'm passionate about. It's gonna be something that I actually feel like I'm contributing to the world, that I would be willing to do all of that with a smile on my face. And I said- Oh, okay, well, so I guess for all the other young people, they should try this too. So like, you know, if they're working at McDonald's, they should just go in, and find their shift supervisor and be like, listen, I expect this to be something where I'm of service to the world and where I'm feeling fulfilled. I'm not feeling fulfilled, okay? So this is gonna need to be better. Yeah, I think that'll work. What would I do and love every day 
even if I was failing. If you guys can get on board with that, if we can build something from a position of wanting to bring value and not worrying about the money, then we can work together. And so they said that they felt the same way and we started this crazy protein bar company called Quest Nutrition. Everyone told us that we were out of our minds. I was talking to Ben earlier about, imagine you're a 15 year old who wants to play in the NBA and all you hear all day long is kids, you're never gonna make it. And to have the fortitude as a teenager to push through that and believe in yourself. It's what I call the arrogance of belief. I was so on fire with the notion that now I was gonna do something that I believed in. Now I could think about my mom and my sister every day. My mom and my sister, both morbidly obese. I knew they were gonna die too soon if I didn't do something about it. I believed it was my problem to solve. I believed there was nothing I couldn't do if I set my mind to it. And armed with that, armed with the passion to know that I'm showing up every day fighting for my mom and my sister, I'm not thinking about money. I'm not gonna make decisions based on profitability. I'm gonna make decisions based on what is metabolically real. What is the actual answer to the question of how do you end metabolic disease? And I Explain to me how Quest nutrition bars, which are loaded with sugar, are ending metabolic disease. F give me one patient who has had their metabolic disease ended by Quest Nutrition bars. Like, what, what are your sugar bars doing for the metabolic health of the world? Nothing. Also, like, Jesus Christ, man. Like, you know, for it's kind of ironic that you're talking about, like, what really matters, and then you go along talking shit about your family. Like, you're being really mean, and it's kind of awkward. Like, what did they ever do to you? Also, dude, it's something called survivorship bias, where if you're talking to people who became NBA players, it's going to seem like it's a lot more likely to become an NBA player than it actually is because everybody who had the goal of becoming an NBA player that you can think of became an NBA player because they're famous. Okay, the rest of the people aren't famous. So you can't think of as many. That's survivorship bias. Makes it seem like it's more likely than it is that someone could become an NBA player. Okay. Okay, like, and same to you with your nutrition bar company. Yeah, of course you think it's really likely, but that's because you don't know how many people have tried to create a nutrition bar company and failed. So, I mean, this is just so unhelpful. I mean, how does this help anyone? For most people, the problem is, like, number one, they can't quit their job. Number two, they couldn't get financing like this to start a company like this. I'm sure a lot of people have great ideas for companies. I'm sure a lot of people have better ideas for a company than fucking Quest Nutrition. But the problem is they don't have access to funding like you do. They don't have access to a safety net the way that you do, Tom. They don't have burly guys coming into their film presentation to go uh, give them an opportunity on a silver platter. They don't have that. So what good is this to them? I play a game called No Bullshit, What Would It Take? No Bullshit, What Would It Take to End Metabolic Disease? And the answer is you have to make food that people choose based on taste and it happens to be good for them. That's the only way it's gonna happen on a global scale. And so that's what we set out to do. But when you're armed with the notion of, I want to end metabolic disease, not I want to get rich, not I want to sell my company. I want to end metabolic disease. And you let that be your driver. Now you know what your why is. And we'll get to that more in a minute. Does he actually think that Quest Nutrition is going to end metabolic disease? Because that's incredible. Set at the forefront, from 2010 to 2013 alone, Quest grew by 57,000%. Comparative companies were growing by eight. We grew by- Okay, but that was the average of all private companies. I mean, weren't you just founded in 2010? So, I mean, doesn't that mean like if you sold zero bars in 2010 and then you sold 57,000 bars, that's 57,000%, so? And it's not that impressive. By 57,000. I'm telling you right now, 
saving the world, doing the right thing, thinking about your customer, wanting them to win, wanting them to shine, wanting great things for your employees. It's big. Seriously, I'm going to say this again. You sell sugar garbage in a wrapper. Relax. You're not saving the world. You're not doing anything good. You are selling people candy bars and telling them they're healthy. That's all it is. And you're marking them up like crazy. Big fucking business. Ooh, he dropped the F bomb. At Quest, we made more in a single day than our previous company made annually. All by putting the customer first. All by saying we're only gonna do what's actually metabolically advantageous. Because how does it serve me to make a product that doesn't? Then why is there so much sugar in Quest bars? When my mission, in my opinion, was to save my mom. And I would ask myself of every decision, tough decision that we had to make, which decision actually helped save my mom? And then we would make that decision. We hit number two on the Inc. 500 list. We were officially a unicorn company. We were a startup that bootstrapped, believe it or not, and made it all the way to a valuation of over a billion dollars. All right, if you guys... All right, this drives me crazy. The, the whole thing about bootstraps is pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. And the idea, like the, the, the reason this this is a is a thing is the original meaning of that phrase was that it is implied to be something impossible because you can't pick yourself up by your own bootstraps because they're attached to you like you can't just like you can't it's it's like if i said like just lift yourself up by your shoes like and you you just try to pick up your shoes to lift yourself up to get to reach something above your head you can't do it it's impossible. So that's why that drives me crazy. The way that like now we're actually using it like it's something possible. Like it, it's supposed to mean it's impossible. I want to have success in your life and I don't care what it is that you're trying to do. There's going to be two things that you need to do. We're going to talk about the first one now, which is develop your mindset. We'll get to the second one later, which is build your business, but we'll get to that. For now, let's just talk about your mind. The most important thing is your mind. Make no mistake about that. Right now, the only thing that is holding you back, I promise you, and whatever excuse you're telling yourself, it's bullshit. The only thing that's holding you back is the way that you think about yourself and the world. That's it. That's privilege. Flat. You have not built the mechanisms in your mind that you need to free yourself from the matrix. And boys and girls, the matrix has you. Who knows David Foster Wallace? You all have an assignment to do. And by the way, if you don't do this, don't think for one second you actually want to be successful. Stop fucking fooling yourself and go do something easier. Because this video is like 18 minutes long. It's one of the most profound things you'll ever watch. David Foster Wallace, this is water. In the talk, what he makes clear is the fish is the last one to realize that it's in water. Think about it from a human perspective. We had to discover air. We had to discover gravity. They're so ubiquitous, you literally don't see them. You take them for granted as just being there. And that's how people take their belief system. Right now, you think you're capable of certain things and incapable of others, and that is your water. Sir, your water is privilege. You can see that you're telling yourself lies, and they are disempowering lies, by the way, because I am not some grand fan of the truth. I'm a grand fan of doing and believing that which moves you towards your goals. Do and believe that which moves you towards your goals. That's it. Once you put that belief at the core of your being, you will be amazed at what you're able to accomplish. When I say take the red pill, what I'm talking about is waking up to the way the world really is. Oh boy. The amount of potential that you have, I always say is nearly 
unlimited. But I only say that so I don't have to get into stupid arguments with people about throwing absolutely ridiculous things out just to try to defeat the notion. And that's somebody who wants me to be wrong. But ask yourselves right now, if my message is you can do anything you set your mind to without limitation, don't you hope I'm right? Well, I can't, I can't really hope for something that I know to be factually incorrect. Like, it's, it's just a fact that that's not true. It's, and it's only varying degrees of not true. It's the more privilege you have, the, the more true it is. I, like, it's just amazing to me. Like, it, it, is he really this oblivious? I think he is, you know, because that's part of privilege is being oblivious to it. But it's just, it's just incredible. I mean, there are just some very real material realities that he has just never um has never collided within his life so and he just doesn't understand how real that is for some people most people don't get an opportunity like that most people don't have the opportunity to quit a job like that most people don't get to start two companies okay like that's just not the way that it works you go simply because you were willing to believe. Humans lead with belief. Humans lead with belief. You won't take the first step down any path unless you believe you can actually get where you're going. And this is where people get stuck in the matrix. You don't push yourself hard enough. You don't make big enough demands. You think small, you dream small, you make small demands of yourself. If you want to see what big demands look like, look at David Goggins. Anybody know David Goggins? For those of you who don't, let me tell you a quick story. David Goggins is a Navy SEAL. He wanted to honor fallen SEALs. To do that, he wanted to pick the hardest thing that he could think of. It was a 135-mile race. The person who put on the race said, you can't enter my race unless you run 100 miles in a 24-hour period, have you? The answer was no. He said, there's one four days from now. If you can complete four days, he weighed 250 pounds. In four days, if you can complete a 100-mile race literally running around a high school track, think about how torturous that would be. If you can complete a 100 miles in 24 hours, then you get to run my race and raise the funds for your charity. So David decides he's going to run that race. He wasn't prepared. He was overweight. By mile 70, he had broken both of his feet he had shin splints. His calf muscles were beginning to tear off the bone. He sat into a chair because he literally had nothing left to give. He urinated on himself, blood, because he couldn't move. He couldn't get up to go to the restroom, so he defecated on himself. And as he's sitting there in the chair, peeing blood in total agony with feces on his back, the only question he had was, what do I need to do to finish the remaining 30 miles? And so he taped his feet so that they would go numb and he would stop feeling the pain of the broken feet. He ate something so that he would have the needed energy to keep going. And he got up and he started walking. And he walked for, I don't remember how many miles. And his wife said, at this pace, you're not going to finish. And so he ran the remaining 19 miles, broken feet, stress fractures in his shins, blood, excrement, and he finished on time. Yeah, I don't believe this story. I just don't. That's what a human being is capable of. That's what a liar is capable of. Okay, yeah, so here's the deal is, that story is that's not what happened so the overweight thing is he was overweight before he became a navy seal but he was pretty built and uh, 195 pounds when he when he did the san diego one day which is the the 24 hour uh 101 mile race and he it's not true that he had not been training what what is true is that he had not been specifically training for the san diego race but he had been training to do that ultra marathon because the ultra marathon he wanted to do was the death valley one um but he had to qualify 
So he didn't have any training that was specific to that course, but he was training to do an ultra marathon. In fact, the Death Valley um, ultra marathon is, I believe, 135 miles. So he was he was training specifically for that. And all of those embellishments, I don't know where uh, Tom got those. Those are not those are not part of the, the, the real story. He, it, uh, David had actually been, um, had been running twice a day, uh, for the months leading up to the San Diego event as, as one would expect. <sighs> I mean, I mean, the story is just obviously bullshit. If your if your muscles are tearing off, you cannot go another 30 miles. It, you will be physically unable to because you don't have anything that is able to move your bones. Because of that, I've gone from scrounging in my couch cushions to find enough change to put gas in my car, that is a true story, to building a billion dollar business. The fact that there was enough change in your couch cushions to put gas in your car says a lot. Also, the fact that you had a car to put gas into, okay. Do it. If this is about building your mindset, how? To me, it's about mind the gap. There is a gap between who you are now and who you need to become, and that gap is a gap of skill set, plain and simple. Remember, you're an adaptation machine. Your job is to place yourself under stress and then force yourself to grow. So back to Mr. Yoked, you don't get those muscles by looking at the weights. You get those muscles by going under the weight and not stopping when it hurts. You stop when you can no longer recruit the muscles enough to move the weight. Yeah, I don't recommend that. Muscle down. And then the body comes and builds it back up. The conscious part is tearing it down. Your job is to put yourself in stressful situations. Your job is to push yourself to the limit of what you think you're capable of and then go past that. And when you're able to push yourself past that, when you're able to get into the Goggins reps, as I call it, when you're able to exist in that zone, long past where it started hurting, long past when it got boring, long past when you were terrified that you'd never be able to do it, that's when you'll begin to adapt because you're telling your body. Or that's when you'll begin to injure yourself permanently. Because that's what would have happened if, if that story had been true, okay? Adapt or die. Be the Matrix, as was made very clear in the intro. The real question is, what is your kung fu? You've got to figure that out, right? This is a path to execution we're talking about right now. Path one is about the mindset. So, what is your kung fu? My kung fu is business. Oh, I don't appropriate. I knew that I was going to have to learn business in order to control the resources, in order to control my art. And this is how you're gonna develop your Kung Fu. One, always be reading. The most important mathematical formula you will ever encounter is right there. I-I equals I-O. It's That's not a mathematical formula. Like, how would I solve that for X? If you want to solve a problem in your business that's become particularly tricky, you need to be taking in a ton of data so that your unique mind, your unique worldview, your unique life, having grown up the way that you grew up, the way that your brain is wired, all of it, you will come up with ideas that nobody else is gonna come up with. Like garbage in, garbage out if they're like your ideas. Two, open yourself up to being changed. I can't tell you how many times I've recommended people my list of books, which by the way, you can find on impacttheory.com, Tom's reading list. It is the 25 books any human being that wants to excel should read in order. And before every book, say a little prayer. And the prayer goes like this. I am open to being changed fundamentally and for the better by this book. I am open to being changed fundamentally and for the better from this book. You've got to go into the book wanting it to be right. You've got to go into the book hoping that it gives you some piece of knowledge. Remember, everyone, everyone is your superior in some way. And once you learn to check your ego, sit at their feet with absolute humility and be open to their ideas, especially the one that contradicts what you believe today, 
then you'll get somewhere. And I've got some really amazing news for you guys. I have a question for you, uh, oh captain, my captain. Did you read those 25 books before you founded Quest Nutrition? Because I bet you didn't. So how did you get successful? Oh, it was just privilege? Oh, okay. I've got some really amazing news for you guys. Your current skill set has already taken you as far as it's going to take you. If you don't put yourself on a path to learn and very aggressively, where you are now is where you'll be. How could you possibly know that? Be in five years. The key is crossing that chasm of skill set. All right, realize what you Notice how the way that his career trajectory changed had nothing to do with his skill set. It had everything to do with those, those guys came in and offered him an opportunity. It changed again when he realized he was unhappy and went to somewhere where he'd be happier. It, at no point did his career trajectory ever change as the result of him acquiring a new skill. If it did, he would have mentioned it. It did not. But yet, that's the advice that he's giving us. The hypocrisy. It's always the hypocrisy. The way that these self-help gurus are, are preaching that to do, like that they're preaching that you need to do, it's never the way that they became successful, quote unquote. It's never the way that they got there. And they're never gonna give you that secret. So that's where we're gonna leave that for today. Uh, if you like this and you want me to continue with this presentation and go through part two, uh, let me know in the comments. I've been Mac. Peace out. Bye!